So, script will run pipelines. Uh, this is a bit of a follow-up talk from what I did last May. I know it's a long time ago. Um, but there's been quite a lot that's happened since then. Uh, the lightweight render pipeline has been released and subsequently killed. It is now the universal render pipeline. And the high definition render pipeline is coming along nicely. Uh, the previous talk isn't you know, really required knowledge, but if you're interested in seeing you know, how it's progressing in about a year or so, maybe it's worth checking out. So, I want to go over a couple of things tonight. Basically, what is the scriptable render pipeline system? How is it uh, going to be working? Why is Unity trying to do it? And what advantages you might have? Up first, bit of a uh, graph there on what happens with the old system. This is the standard Unity rendering system. Um, if you want to try and start messing with uh, rendering methods, rendering styles, that kind of stuff. As you can see, it, it's not really uh, that rewarding in terms of how much money, time, and effort you put in uh, to your output quality, especially for a long amount of time. It's got a difficulty curve. It's just like a cliff. You know, the Great Wall of China, basically the same. Donald Trump's extremely jealous of a wall, that's all. So what is Unity trying to do? Effectively, they're trying to get people to start digging into the rendering code themselves. Um, if anyone's been using Unity for more than about five years, you might remember the old uh, asset store flips that appeared on Steam Early Access. They looked like shit. Um, you might have recognized that they used the same grass texture, the same skybox everywhere. This is one of the goals of uh, the scriptable render pipeline, is to get rid of that. If they can get people w working with their own rendering systems, um, they get games that don't look just like a Unity game. You've got more varied styles, more varied appearances, and um, you know, a broader, more diverse showcase for Unity. It also means that they can offload some performance optimization from themselves onto the individual developers. Uh, with a standard render pipeline, they've got to sort of take a good guess about what people are doing with the renderer, how they're using it, and try and optimize it for that. Now, if people can do it themselves, you know, Unity doesn't have to be so precise with it. They can take broader decisions and let people filter it out. Well, you might be thinking, OK, that's coming eventually down the road. Why would we bother learning it now? And the answer is, it's probably going to be you know, a year or two before the, script, the, before the standard render pipeline just dies. It's going to be killed off. Uh, the scriptable render pipeline was designed to solve a lot of problems with fragmentation in the renderers. And as a new standard, you know, short term, it's just going to add one more different type of render you have to learn. Long term, it's probably going to be the one that kills off the standard one. Uh, the lightweight render pipeline, now called the universal render pipeline, is probably going to be the sort of every man's renderer. If you're an indie developer, that's likely what you're going to use. Um, it'll cover most end cases, uh, laptops, PCs, mobiles, tablets, so on and so forth. Uh, the high definition render pipeline, that's going to be for serious applications and next gen games. So PlayStation 4 Plus and Xbox One, I forget what the One X, I think is the, the top tier one now, as well as the next generation, so the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox, uh, whatever they call it. Now, serious applications, it's a bit of a new thing that's sort of slowly been cooking for the last five to 10 years. And it's sort of where everyone thought it would be. Um, so not a huge surprise. Uh, anyone who's familiar with architectural visualization, so ArchViz, um, technical analysis overlay, so any sort of simulation work that would want to be overlaid over the real thing, so you can see points of failure, points of main stress, uh, where you're making the best downforce in your race car. Um, as well as training simulations. Uh, often these are in VR to get people familiar with a factory or a process um, without having to actually take them onto a dangerous work site. Advertising and sales. Um, some of you might have seen the uh, Unity and BMW collaboration where they used uh, real-time ray tracing to show a new uh, BMW car. And it looked fantastic. So that's another application for the HDRP. Um, it's sort of real-time advertising rendering. So instead of running your offline renderer off Maya or whatever overnight, you're getting, say, 30 frames a second, because 60 is a bit too much for now. Film and TV is another one that I don't think many people were really expecting them to push so hard into, but they've actually made significant ground in this field. Uh, I believe they had 10 entries in the Sundance Film Festival 2019 uh, that were running on Unity. Um, these were films and interactive applications. Uh, as well as the uh, short film Baymax Dreams, based on the Big Hero 6 IP. So here we've got a couple of uh, examples of it. So we've got the Big Hero 6 up here. Um, up the top right, uh, we've got one of the, I forgot what it's called. It's one of the films from uh, the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, examples of technical overlays here. Uh, CFD, you want to see whether your 
computational fluid dynamics analysis lines up with uh, the real wind tunnel work and smoke work. And you can see you know, what the effect of damage is um, over a car in a real race. Advertising, you've got this one here. Obviously, you're not going to be able to line up four or five cars in the exact same spot. Perfect for rendering, because you can just line there, cut up your screenshots, get nice, fancy colors like that, as well as for uh, full page advertisements. So what's in it for the users? The renderer is now actually worth working with. Right? Previously, that CG Inc. file was a huge pain in the ass to deal with. It's you know, arcane. It wasn't very well commented. Uh, for a novice programmer that wasn't familiar with the language, it, it just looks horrific to use. And in addition to that, you've got a new set of scriptable render, pi scriptable render pipeline based tools that are included with the package. So you know, that, that's the shader graph editor, VFX editor, uh, as well as several others. And most importantly, other than, you know, unlike third party assets, these are maintained by Unity. So when they release, you know, HDRP version 7.1, the new tools work with them. There's no worrying about compatibility or, you know, is this going to break my existing stuff? It, it should just work pretty much straight out the box. And you've got really, you know, less of a chance of it being abandoned in the next three or four years as the product cycle goes. So this is, you know, the crux of it here. You've got an almost linear sort of relationship between how much developer skill, time, and effort you put in and your output quality. You don't need to worry about hiring your super duper expensive senior graphics engineers to actually touch even one thing of your graphics engine. You can just go in and mess with it yourself. So uh, the main part of this is the renderer asset. Um, this comes included, uh, one of each, with uh, the uh, universal render pipeline as well as a high definition render pipeline. Um, you can create your own, and I very much suggest that you should, um, using those things there, uh, those addresses there, and just make sure you assign it in the graphics thing. It serves two purposes. Firstly, it's a bit like the old graphics quality settings page, um, which I think was under edit project settings quality. Um, so that's where you'd set resolutions, light counts, and so on and so forth. Except now you can disable uh, features on and off. So if you don't need screen space reflection, you kill it. Um, but it also does the limits uh, much the same way, just with a lot more fidelity and detail in it. So light counts, decal counts, shadow resolution, cache sizes, uh, reflection probe sizes. And the second part of that is it's your portal to the lighting and shading code. So it's still using a similar set of uh, rendering codes, you know, much like the old lighting.cg inc, um, except now they're written in something far more readable, far more accessible. There's no need to have to download um, the built-in shader pipeline, uh, built-in uh, shaders uh, from the Unity website by selecting the right version and so on and so forth. It's just there. So why would you use this if you wanted to use it straight away? If you're doing a game that just needs one or two fancy little features, don't bother. Um, just add it into the standard render pipeline, release it in the next year or so. There's, there's no point sort of migrating the entire project over to a new system. However, if you want to make use of some weird rendering feature that Unity doesn't support out the box, definitely the way to go. A couple of good examples here. Making an underwater game. You've got a main directional light from the sun. You want that to be absorbed by the water so you get that nice blue hue. And you also want the water to sort of refract the different wavelengths, the red, green, and blue, at different angles. You could mess with that uh, in your scene, but that means you have to add three more lights, three more directional lights, three more shadow passes, and so on and so forth, just to get that to work. Here, you do it in the rendering code. One pass, your main sunlight refracts, refracts perfectly in the water. It gets absorbed in the water. Easy. If you're doing non-photorealistic rendering, like tune lighting or other sort of artistic styles, you do that in uh, scriptable render pipelines. And it automatically applies to every other shader because it's done at such a high level. The other thing you can do is if you're looking for photorealistic rendering, but in a sort of different weird way, for example, lit entirely by cube maps, including directional lights, that's where you do it. Because again, you do it in one spot in the, in the uh, renderer asset, and that just propagates automatically. No need to worry about you know, 10 different variations of shaders. It's all there. Uh, so yeah, just, these are examples that you might have to do if you wanted to have like a tune shader game. You need a tune shader for the train, one for the opaque objects, one for transparent objects, one for special effects, probably one for UI, blah, 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 blah. Now, you just do it once in the pipeline. So previously, it also, uh, the standard render pipeline included sort of other bloat. If you didn't need stuff, like if you didn't need uh, reflection probes in your tune lit game, it'd still calculate them 
as applicable. It, you know, it had run through uh, any routines to try and find them, try and, try and process them. Even if there was none, there's still a bit of an overhead. Now, there's none of that. You cull the things that you don't need. You leave all your uh, objects, uh, terrain, transparent effects, fancy shader effects um, as they were, and you just do the, the uh, custom tune script around the pipeline. So much faster, so much easier to maintain. Now, the first of the tools included with the system, and I'm saying first because it's the one I like the most, is the shader graph editor. Um, can I get a quick show of hands? Who's familiar with uh, node graph editors or visual coding, visual scripting, spaghetti generators? Yep. <laughs> it's just one of them. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, basically, the operations are the, uh, you know, C uh, the CG language shader, so dot products adds basically just a lot of math. Um, so it's actually also a very good way to learn the language of uh, shader code. So as a first step, in, you know, stepping stone to writing code from scratch, absolutely perfect. Subgraphs are one of the things included in it. Um, it's basically just a, an external function as a node. So you click the one node, you can go into it, and it's just one layer deeper. You can just compress any operation that might sort of clutter up your main graph into that one performance, uh, one subgraph. Go back up a level, it's just there. Easy. Accepts custom inputs, custom outputs. So good. Talking of custom things, custom functions. Uh, not all operations and variables are available in the shader graph by default, but it will accept uh, input from a CG Inc file. So you can write that externally and you reference it in a node. I've got an example on the next page. One good example of this is the gradient editor. You might have been using it um, in the Unity Inspector for some time. Uh, not strictly compatible with uh, shader graphs, but um, there is an equivalent that functions more or less the same. Now, by default, they sample eight points on the gradient. If you don't need eight, because it's a for loop, you only need, say, six or so, you can write your own version of that. They're only sample six. And it runs 25% faster, just like you'd expect. And as for running it, it's not strictly as fast as handwritten code, but there's not a huge amount in it. It's like it's a few percent difference in performance. And the other limitation is that you don't have access to every single variable in it. So if you're running to stencil passes for UI stuff, I don't know why they're still using stencil for UI, but that isn't supported at the moment, and I sort of doubt it will be. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure what they're trying to do there or why they didn't do that. So here's a custom function node. As you can see here, uh, you write your CG include file here, goes into there. Uh, you name your function here, so you have to type that in to make sure that matches. Uh, obviously, set the file. You can type that as a string, and it'll give you like a little area to type stuff in. It's really not a good way to do things. Inputs, outputs. Um, if you've got any errors, it's likely because of these. You need to set these absolutely perfectly, otherwise it'll just turn pink. Um, and the other problem with this is that it doesn't copy-paste well. So if you just, you know, Control-C, Control-V it, or move it into a different thing, it'll lose a lot of the inputs. So you wrap it up in a shader subgraph. And that way, whenever you re reference the subgraph, it's already there. Oops. So, OK. Now, oh, what? sorry, this thing's a bit weird. <laughs> Now, all the stuff that used to be in the window lighting tab is now moved into a profile. Uh, these profiles are fairly universal. They contain quite a lot of settings. They're not quite as powerful as the main uh, render pipeline asset, but for all your post-processing stuff, or a lot of your camera options, that kind of stuff, uh, environment settings, that's where it all belongs. Um, so that's fog, skyboxes, uh, shadows, and so on and so forth. So all your stuff in the graphics tab, all the stuff in the lighting tab is almost in there now, as well as post-processing. Uh, typically, by default, the example scenes for HDRP and the new universal render pipeline, they split these into two types. You don't need to, but it's a sort of a, a sanity saver if you do. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got the environment settings. You want these to be a reflection of what the level or the local environment is. So you've got, obviously, the visual environments, skybox, fog. Uh, Shadow distance, if you've got a large environment, obviously you want to have the shadow distance bespoke to that. You know, if you need five shadows off in the distance, 
Otherwise, you know, if you've got a cave system, maybe you can move the shadow distance down quite a fair bit. So that goes on the left-hand side. Uh, ambient occlusion and screen space reflection. Uh, you might sort of think of those as, oh, no, these are, these are post-processing. You, you want these in the environment settings because that sort of changes, you know, your soft lighting, what reflects properly, and that's sort of something you want to set per environment. Uh, contact shadows, uh, I think they're fairly new to um, scriptable render pipelines, but those are for small things, like, um, you know, if one of the buttons on your T-shirt is cast shadows, obviously the, uh, the depth map shadow map from the scan, that's not going to pick that up. Contact shadows will, um, at the cost of sometimes to look a bit sort of scratchy. Uh, you'll know it when you try it. Uh, indirect lighting control, that's just um, basically an override for ambient lighting and specular lighting. So if you want to say, oh, my ambient lighting's a bit too bright or it's a bit too uh, shiny, that's where you mess with that. So the second one you have is the post-processing settings. So time mapping, bloom, film grain, vignette, color curves, anything like that that sort of changes the style of the image, that's where you keep that. You keep that separate so that you know, firstly, you know, where to find these things, and secondly, so you don't have to dig through an entire giant list of different things um, to find the one you want. Some things can go in either. Uh, typically, I like to keep these um, in the left-hand side in the environment render settings, just because I like them fairly well constant. Uh, exposure, chromatic aberration, white balance, depth of field, Panini projection, those are sort of really camera options. So unless you've got a good reason to change those, you want to keep them set basically for the level, um, especially uh, your gamma, your white balance, and your exposure. So those shouldn't be changing unless you really need them to. Now, the volume system, another very handy thing that's been added uh, with recent versions of Unity and the script we're in the pipeline. Works perfectly. Uh, you might think of these as areas of overrides. So the previous settings, these ones, you set these up to be global, and these allow you to do local ones. Um, and they start off as a cube. You can control the fall off on each uh, face of the cube. So it doesn't have to be like a uniform fall off in all directions. You can have basically you know, a swimming pool and it'll have a gradient on the top or an area that'll have like a gradient on one or two sides. Works pretty much perfectly as you want. Uh, the goal of this, and this replaces something that has been provided by asset store people for bloody decades, is that now you can set these things per area per level. You can change bloom, you can change color grading, you can change tone mapping. If you go from small caves to a large open area, you can change shadow distance. Uh, quick picture of what it looks like in the Unity scene. Um, in this example, I've set a 0 0.5 meter uh, gradient in every single direction. Don't have to do it in every direction, you can do it in any direction you want. Uh, plus, minus, uh, x, y, and z. And you can see the green area is where it is at full strength, and the outside area is where it starts to fade in. It's also a lesson on what not to do. Make sure your blend zones are smooth. If you do it ten, like, where it's like 10 centimeters between vastly different settings, you can see they've changed you know, tone mapping, white balance, color correction, that kind of stuff. Don't ever do that. Because players are like, walk here, everything goes dark gray. Fog appears. Walk back, I can suddenly see two miles again. It just, you know, it's quality of life improvement. It takes 10 seconds to look at make sure you get it right, because people will notice this, and it's a very bad sort of quality part of the game. The volumes and profiles can be scripted. The documentation for this really isn't great. Um, they've done some improvements lately, but effectively, this is how you do it. Um, you'd use these, basically the same method for, say, shadow settings, or you know, white balance or whatever. Um, I've just chosen two post-processing things, uh, bloom and tone mapping. Works effectively the same way. You just got to check which ones uh, int, which ones float, uh, int use because it's a enumerator. Okay, VFX editor, uh, probably the biggest update, well, it really is the biggest update to the Unity post effects, uh, not post effects, uh, particle system since Shuriken. It is GPU based, finally. So if you've got a bit of GPU time, definitely look into this. Uh, for now, it's available on both but only the high-definition render pipeline can support lit particles. Uh, for URP, it's unlit only. Um. <coughs> Typically, you know, it's a particle effect system, so you want to use this for the usual stuff like fires, uh, sparks, explosions. Um, they did Doctor Strange-style portal 
uh, in many demos. And one of the new examples um, is actually grass for terrains, um, because for a long time the high-definition high definition render pipeline didn't have native grass working. So these are the sort of examples um, that they've posted online. Uh, these are all from Unity. Uh, as you can see, we're dealing with exceptionally high particle counts here, a lot of overdraw, but it actually runs dirt cheap. Very easy to color, very easy to use, um, apart from the fact that the editor itself isn't massively responsive. Um, they've got a couple of Node-Graph editors now, and this is really the least polished. Um, hopefully that'll change in the short term. I mentioned using it for grass. Um, this is actually one of the best ways to use it, I found. Uh, you will need to provide it with a height map and or a color map, uh, any extra maps you might need for wind map. Uh, so that means rendering out height maps from terrain. But once you've done that, you're looking at like 64,000 grass planes. For dirt cheap, it's like you know, 0 0.05 milliseconds per frame. It's nothing, right? So there's almost no CPU cost, very, very little GPU cost. Um, there is actually a system where it will grab the main, ca uh, the main camera position. So if you want to walk through the grass and have it bend out of your way, that works fine. Uh, wind blending, fairly simple. There's noise presets there you can use. So that you know, grass waves in the wind, realistically, there's no sort of uniform, every bit of grass plane waves at the same frequency. Uh, color blending, very, very simple again, as well as size and shape variations. And if you want to have different sort of uh, texture planes for grass, so if you've got four or five different types, they wouldn't have five, you'd have four or 16 different types, or maybe nine, if you want to have three by three. That's also available in the system. Now, volumetric fog. Um, can I get a quick show of hands of everyone, anyone who's tried volumetric fog before in a game? How badly did your performance suffer? Pretty badly? Yeah, thought so. Well, this stuff isn't actually too bad. Um, the volumetric system from Unity has been a long time coming. Uh, they've been playing with demos of this since Unity version 5 point something. Um, I think since they hired uh, Robert Kupitz, I think is his name. Uh, they've really sort of gotten serious about it. And for now, it's part of the high definition render, uh, render pipeline. And it actually looks fairly good. It's a bit light on features compared to Aura 2. So if you're used to Aura, it uh, sort of seems like a bit of a step down. But until Aura 2 becomes HDRP compliant, this is really your option. And it's likely to be the future option as well. OK. Um, also, one other thing to add is that it also does include distance fog as part of it. So it does the, the long distance exponential fog blend to Skybox. So no more worrying about you know, the, the sharp cutoff in your terrain as it goes to Skybox and things are getting miscolored and you get this weird sort of out silhouette effect. That's gone. By default, it is a very, very low resolution. 240 by 135 by 64. Now, if you do the math, that is the same amount of pixels as a 1080p screen, 1920 by 1080p. So if you think you know, that, that's a low resolution, it's going to be cheap, it's not. It's effectively a full screen pass in terms of the amount of pixel samples. If you're doing soft, sort of low frequency fog, you're not needing the, you know, the, the super accurate god rays, that's going to be enough. If you need the accurate sort of the, the god rays as they come through trees and stuff, you will have to select the high quality setting. It does hurt performance badly. So think about it a fair bit. Maybe turn it on, maybe turn it off. Uh, the quality setting is enabled in a profile, so you can have that in your environment profile I mentioned earlier. Um, so toggle that toggle off um, as you're going through the game with a bit of script. A couple of examples of where you might want to use the volumetric fog. Uh, underwater, obviously, you know, distance fog there. Uh, snowy, icy, foggy areas, caves, uh, abandoned buildings, monuments. Uh, I should also point out that it does respond with a little tick, tick box to different types of lights, point lights, uh, area lights, directional lights. Point lights probably look the best because they get like a little local effect. Uh, directional lights, they will just shine the entire way through. So if you want to do something that fades out over distance as light is absorbed by fog, you will have to use a different light type other than directional. Uh, the version of a volume system for fog is called a fog, de fog density volume. It's a bit different than the other volume settings, uh, volume profiles. But functionally, it's the same thing. So you can blend it in between distances here. So for example, I've got a smooth blend between the left-hand side and 50% of the uh, width of it. Same for the top. So that gives you the smooth gradient so you don't end up with like a solid, perfect cube made out of fog.
Now, lighting update. They have finally exposed, uh, in the scene view, all of the proper lighting handle controls. So previously they'd, they'd done one or two, um, much like the, you know, the scale gizmos, where you grab things and resize and change shapes and so on and so forth. Now they actually feel like they were programmed by something other than the monkey. Uh, as well as they've added several new types of uh, spotlight, as well as several types of controls for your usual spotlight. So quick example here, in the top one, uh, you've got a point light, change radius, that's really all you can do with it. Uh, second one, you've got a spotlight. So middle one changes depth, outside one uh, changes the outer cone angle, and the inside one, this is a new part, changes the inner cone angle. So in here, as it hit the ground, the outside one will be zero, and on the inside one, that'll be full strength light. So that's one, zero. And that's an easy way to change it, quite simple quality gain for very, very little performance cost. Um, to customise the, the sort of the shape and the fall off of light, without having to use a light cookie texture. And the new lights, oh, sorry, the new lights that come with. Oh, okay. Got a bit of feedback here. Yeah, speaker this way. That way. Walk. Oh, okay. Oh, this is the thing. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right, new light types. Uh, aerial lights, rectangular aerial lights. Very useful st for studio lighting. If you're gonna do some sort of serious application or marketing system, that will be a good match for the sort of the wide, soft lighting that they use in studio shots and so on and so forth. Tube lights, uh, function more or less the same, but they'll go in all directions. Uh, currently, they don't have a thickness property to them, but you can mess with that a bit by using the maximum smoothness value. So if you set smoothness to like 0.99, it'll appear a very sharp, very thin uh, tube light. If you lower that to like 0 0.9, 0 0.95, it will appear thicker. It won't be thicker, but it's, it's a close enough fake. Now, spotlights. These are actually pretty cool. Typical one here, uh, range, in and out of volume, fairly well straight forward. Pyramid. Instead of being a circle, it effectively projects a square. And the most important one here, it's a box type. This is like a local directional light. Um, it's constrained. It's more efficient on shadow map usage than uh, a spotlight or a pyramid light because it covers all of it through straight down. There's no perspective losses. So if you're looking through a tunnel or whatever, um, like if there's going to be a skylight at the top of a, uh, a cave, this might be the way to go because otherwise you have to sort of spread it out and you're losing about a third on each side of your shadow map just to where that intersection is at the top of the cave. So that's definitely something to worth uh, to look at. Another big change for HDRP is that you'll be using actual light units, Lux, Lumen. Uh, they're all a bit weird, because you might be used to you know, seeing the sunlight as intensity 1, or a point light of intensity 0.5. You're not really doing that anymore in HDRP. You'll be using uh, orders of magnitude more strength. So I suggest if you're trying to do lights that match up with a real thing, with sunlight, with incandescent bulbs and that kind of stuff. Find yourself a good reference table, stick to it. Maintain consistency where possible. Another thing about that, it is entirely 100% reliant on tone mapping to look good. If you have tone mapping off or disabled, it will look like absolute garbage. It'll either be blown out to white and you can't see a thing, or far too dark to make out any details whatsoever. Um, so make sure your tone mapping and your exposure are set to something reasonable. Many lights include a color temperature slider. Um, this might be a bit of a sort of weird thing for most people, um, but color temperature is basically, it shifts the light either to red or to blue based on the uh, black body emission temperature, I said that right, uh, of the light emitting object. So for example, a, ca a candle burning at X degrees Celsius will emit a certain color of light. The sun burning at 6,500 degrees Kelvin will emit a certain color of light, and so on and so forth. So if you see bright things emitting blue flames, you've got a fireplace or whatever, this is actually a quite handy little thing to uh, automate that process, get your ballpark in a realistic area. No one's going to force you to be 100% accurate, but if you're close enough, it should produce reasonable results all the time. Another good thing, uh, not exclusive to SRP as far as I know, but is that they've added a physical camera setting. So. If you're familiar with uh, apertures and lens distances and so on and so forth, this is for you. Most people, 
Uh, probably not. Have we got anyone here who is a photographer or is familiar with this sort of stuff? Any animators, perhaps? No? Uh, one, maybe? A bit. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a bit of a problem. It is optional, so if you don't want to use it, don't use it. <laughs> but it does plug in automatically to depth of field and other post-processing effects. So if you wanted to match cameras properly, that's how you do it. Uh, Anti-aliasing options have been moved from a post-processing effect to a per-camera effect, just a little drop-down. Uh, none, FXAA, if you want to be really cheap. Uh, temporal anti-aliasing, if you want to spend a bit more time on it, but you know it'll have some ghosting effects because it's based on the frame and the previous frame to sort of smooth things out. And sub-pixel morphological anti-aliasing, which is basically like a sort of pattern detection. It's my favorite. Really, they're up to sort of personal preferences, but FXAA is super cheap. TAA and SMAA are a bit more expensive, but high quality. Try it out for your game. Sometimes, you know, it'll pick up things like stars and blow the stars in the sky into blackness. So it's definitely something you need to make sure that you've got set correctly. Custom frame settings are at the bottom of the list uh, in terms of cameras. Not because they're useless, but because that's where they are. Um, think of this as a mini pipeline asset. Uh, in many applications, like the rearview mirror of a racing game, or for uh, cube maps that are rendered, or for if you're like in-game security cameras, or billboards, or live replays going off on the side, this is what you really want to have a look at, because you don't need to use every single rendering feature for those cameras. You might see that you know rearview mirrors in your car, in your racing games, they won't have shadows or something, or they won't have screen space and occlusion, or they won't have screen space reflection. That's to make them super cheap, super easy to render. Um, and just make the entire game perform a lot better. So go through this, enable a few things, disable a few things, cull anything that you don't think is going to be needed by that camera, especially if it is going to be like an auxiliary one, like a security camera or a review camera, and you will see decent performance games by messing with that. Now, a bit more on the physical camera. I've gone over this a bit. Uh, many of your um, focal distance aperture uh, settings will feed into the post-processing system. So your depth of field should match fairly well with what a real camera would show at that time. So if you're trying to match animations to real footage, or if you're trying to go for a particular artistic look, or if you've got a keen photographer or cameraman on the team and they're used to using those controls, this is the way to go. Otherwise, you can set it manually. Depth of field has manual settings for you know, blur in and blur out distances. Some things like exposure and lighting, they're handled in the profile system. So whether that's your environment profile, your post processing profile, they're not done um, in the camera. So if you want to mess with those, just make sure that you look there. Don't forget about them. Uh, for visualizations, people are used to seeing things through the eyes of a camera. You know, obviously, it's the most photorealistic thing. People do it for billboards and so on and so forth. So if you want to have that kind of look, if you're going for that you know, realistic, stylized, what people are used to look, that's the way to go. It's like with uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, you're all familiar with you know, the slight color separation that you get at the edge of the image. We've had lenses that have fixed that for decades, but because people got used to it back in, well, I don't know, whenever the 1950s, 1960s, we've sort of been stuck with it then because that's what's accepted as real. Now, Panini projection. You might not have heard of this. You may have heard me talk about projection correction um, if there's one or two people here from last time I did this talk. This is now an official Unity uh, post-processing thing. It is absolutely brilliant. It's something really no one's ever heard of, but it is so important, especially if you're doing serious games and applications. Effectively, it's a type of uh, fisheye lens correction. Uh, it distorts the image, uh, so it sort of blows it out in the middle, roughly approximating a sort of cylindrical mapping instead of, um, well, I'll quite show you. So if you're in the right spot, face on, dead center of the screen, in the right uh, distance away from the screen relative to your field of view, everything should look correct. It's a bit like if you've seen uh, you know, advertisements on the football field or on the cricket field. They're always sort of stretched in one direction or they're sort of skewed. But from the point of view of the camera that's looking at the commentators, they line up. That's what this does. So as you can see here, we've got two examples, uh, one on the left, does not have it enabled. So you can start to see a bit of stretching around the outside of the image. Um, on the far left and the far right, everything looks a bit too distorted, a bit too big. Whereas on the right, it's you know, perfectly propor proportioned, you know, the car's taking good center stage, 
and uh, everything looks reasonable. There's no sort of stretching or weird field of view effects. Now, like I said, for uh, serious applications, you can see the one at the top there, that looks like you know, a Quake 3 player is trying to play with 180 degrees field of view. It's almost impossible to you know, get a good grip of it uh, from down in the street level, from the wrong position. Um, for that to look correctly, you'd have to be at the same altitude as that uh, billboard and about maybe two meters away from it. Whereas the one on the bottom, it looks acceptable from a, a much wider range of positions. It's like a giant area uh, in front of the image where that will be viewed as acceptable to the human brain. So apart from the obvious billboarding signs, it can be useful for Steam page images. Um, make sure you've got this as an option somewhere in your game so you're not misleading customers. Um, but if the image isn't full screen and it's not center screen, it does help. Um, so that users can see and get a good idea of, of the perspective of your game without it looking a bit weird. Now, to try and get the most performance possible out of the universal render pipeline, it's more about working with the optimizations. Uh, they've gone and try to, tried to optimize it basically for a, a fairly wide range of games. So you, you typically have one sunlight, you typically have between two, four, maybe seven point lights and spotlights throughout the game. So that's what they've optimized it for. Now, the way this works is it tries to compile that to a single pass. Rather than have to render everything again and again and again and again for each light, it'll accept like an upfront fixed cost and says, as long as you're within these limits, you just pay once. One single fixed cost. And that's how you make it run extremely well. If you want to make it run faster with Okay, so you're not using all of those. So maybe you only need one spotlight and two point lights. That's when you go into the universal render pipeline, render asset code, change those limits, and then it runs faster. So your upfront fixed cost then is lower. So that's how you get your performance gains. You try and change that fixed cost, and you stay in each fixed cost. For HDRP, it's a bit different. Um, if you think about it as just a big collection of all the fancy rendering features, You've got subsurface scattering, you've got transmission, uh, high definition rendering, multi-pass shaders. You know, you've got metal clear coat um, on your cars, on your car paint, so on and so forth. Every one of them can be backported to uh, the universal render pipeline. And if you only need one or two of those special features, that's what I'd recommend. I'd recommend going through the HDIP code, saying, OK, oh, this is how they do it. I'll copy one or two of these over the URP. That's going to be faster. UIP only makes sense if you're using a, you know, a decent amount of these things, so more than probably half. And there's, there's more I haven't mentioned now. Planar reflection, pro, reflection probes, for example. They're, they're quite really useful as well. So the key to unlocking performance with HDRP is culling all of those features you don't need. If you don't need screen space reflection, cull it. That's what you want to do. So you want to be looking at maybe trying to get rid of 10 to 30% of those features. That gets you the, the performance back while still maintaining everything you need from the HDRP in terms of uh, rendering capabilities. Because if you don't do that and you leave all those features in there, your game will run at 40 frames a second on the beastliest PC you could ever think of. It's just, if you run at full fat, it's not going to work. It's not going to be a pleasant time. There are quite a few future developments to look out for. Um, if you're familiar with the procedural sky, um, that defaults with Unity. That came back in Unity version 5. I don't think there's anyone in Unity that knows who built it or when it was built. Um, it's a bit of a mystery to them. So they've started to replace, uh, started to design a replacement for that. Um, I think that's going into HDRP first. Probably is going to be on U uh, the Universal Render Pipeline not too long after that. And it's going to play a lot better with uh, the high definition range, the tone mapping. We're going to get proper physical values for the sun. So everything looks a lot you know, nicer, more reliable because really you don't want to be putting in sort of janky values for how strong the sun is. Terrain editor improvements. Um, a few versions back, they added better terrain painting tools. So height map, blending between splat maps, um, better stamp systems, and terrain holes. I know this has been a long time feature request for everyone who's used Unity terrain and then abandoned it for something else. Now you can cut holes in the terrain. It is still limited by uh, mip map resolution, so if you go further away, your holes will look a bit funny. Um, I'm not sure if that's planning to be fixed or if they're just going to accept that as a limitation. In the future, they're going to be moving to a better, 
faster, high quality version of vegetation rendering. Um, right now, it's all on the CPU. It's not particularly fast. It's not particularly good looking. Uh, it doesn't instance that well. The patches aren't great. And there's some weird features that I'm not sure what they were thinking of when they designed it, probably back in the late 1800s. Um, but I think it's going to be fairly similar to the VFX editor. So a lot more in the GPU, a lot faster for certain patches. So you know, get ready to crank those grass particle counts up. Get ready, you know, full forest environments are uh, on the cards. Another thing incoming is the PhysX update. Uh, going to be much more stable around the joints. If you've had joints that sort of break up at high speeds, high angular velocities, high changes in speeds, um, you might have seen a character turn into spaghetti at some point. Uh, Kerbal Space Program is sort of famous for this. If you drop an astronaut from a building, they have a chance of sort of blowing up and they're like their arms will go over there, but they'll still be connected by a large polygon. That's likely to happen a lot less. And of course, for the universal render pipeline, uh, the lit particle VFX editor, as opposed to just unlit, it will be lit in the near future. So if you've got a bit of GPU power to spare, definitely the way to go. Some warnings before you get too excited about this sort of stuff. It is not as old and stable as the default render pipeline. It is still fairly new. It's not sort of battle proven just yet. Um, I'm not sure if we've seen any URP games released. I, there's been a couple of small apps released on uh, with HDRP. Uh, mostly engineering, but I've not seen and I don't know of any big scale ones. So having said that, Universal Render Pipeline is released. It's, it's got a full release, 2019.2. So look into it. It should be fine to use if you're planning to release a game in, say, the you know, next three months. So it should be stable enough for then. Uh, if you want to wait six months, it'll probably be even more stable. HDRP, on the other hand, has had a bit of a list of weird, funny graphics bugs that sort of mostly they've sorted out, but it has gone several times, you know, a version or two where a long-standing bug has not been fixed. For example, uh, previously the screen, uh, screen space subsurface scattering, oh, sorry, uh, that caused very many things to turn green. There was no reason to it, it, it just happened. So if things went green, it was because of that. And it lasted for several months. I've had it a couple of times now, where it's something to do with, I think it's NAN error, where the screen will just turn blue. And it's to do with the Bloom post-processing being affected by something. Who knows? Um, so if you're doing small graphics applications for you know, serious applications for games, previews, archvis, HDRP should be fine. If you're planning to develop a full-scale game, HDRP, maybe you should think about it, but don't put all your, put all your eggs in that basket just yet. Maybe give it another six months or so. If it's stable then, yeah, then go for it. Some assets to strongly consider. Um, I always like to include a little bit of a, a note about this at the end of presentations, so that you've got you know, a good idea of where to go. The Unity VFX particle system, uh, particle samples. Uh, you can find these on the Twitter or on the Unity blog. It's a set of nine or 10. I'm not sure if I've added new ones yet. Um, particle examples that use the new Unity VFX editor. Uh, they've actually added grass now. There's things like butterfly systems. So a particle system that will align itself, spawn, uh, it, it's not a quad, it's a small mesh, that will then flap its wings and it'll be butterflies flying in a direction. All on the GPU, all that cheap. So it's a great way to learn the system because these are some very, very good solid examples. Well commented, well explained, very well laid out. So as a training tool, you know, really nice to use. The Measured Materials Library is available for free on the Unity Asset Store. It is for the high definition render pipeline, and it is absolutely amazing. Um, it's a, a very, very wide, broad sample of high quality materials. Uh, admittedly, it is designed for the automotive use, so there's you know, car paints, car brake patterns, and so on and so forth. But you've also got leather, wood, cloth, metal, advanced paint shaders, advanced materials like carbon fiber and anisotropic things. So you know, anything that has a small pattern that can get lit uh, weirdly, you know, CDs, carbon fiber, any, any sort of weave. They look great. There's perfect examples. They're all calibrated. They're all you know, ready for production. So use those. They're free, free to use. Get used to them. They provide a very good example that you should follow. DXR ray tracing. I deliberately didn't go into this because it is still a little, little bit rough. It's, it's not something 
that you would then go recommend to people as of just yet. Uh, there have been some good results, but it's not at the user-friendly stage. So if you're already considering it, if you're already looking into it, you know, by all means, go in, have a look at it, try a few things out, maybe make a build, maybe make a couple of videos. But if you're not already very interested in it at that point, I would say leave it alone for now. Come back you know, six months, sometime next year. It might be more stable then. You might have to less, uh, mess around a lot less. And then, you know, because Unity is supposed to be known for its good user experience for developers. It's less clumsy than Unreal. Right now, DXR isn't at that level. When it is, I think it's going to be an absolute hit. And when the hardware becomes a lot less expensive, because goddamn, those cards are so bloody expensive. And that's it. Um, so, have we got any questions here from the audience about scriptable render pipelines or any of the topics? No? Anyone? All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, hopefully, I was able to inform you a bit about this sort of stuff, get you a bit excited about the scriptable render pipelines, where they're going, where they come from, a bit of history, how to use them, some of the tools included. And uh, yeah, thanks again for having me.